So this is the 22nd day, a uh, day of prayer for the souls in purgatory who are most devoted to the Sacred Heart. Our Divine Lord loves the poor sufferers in purgatory with an infinite love and ardently desires to receive them into heaven. Let us try to gain many indulgences today for those who, while on earth, most loved and honored His Sacred Heart. The devotion to the Holy Souls is so full of doctrine and embodies so much that it is supernatural, that is supernatural, that we need not be surprised at the influence it exercises over the spiritual life. In the first place, it is a hidden work from first to last. We do not see the results so that there is little food for vainglory. Neither is it a devotion, the exercise of which appears in any way before the eyes of others. It implies, moreover, an utter ignoring of self by making away with our own satisfactions and indulgences and keeping up a tender interest in an object which does not directly concern ourselves. It is not only for the glory of God, but it is for His greater glory and for His soul glory. It leads us to think purely of souls, which it is very difficult to do in this material world, and to think of them too simply as spouses of Jesus. We thus gain a habit of mind which is fatal to the spirit of the world and fatal to the tyranny of human respect, while it goes far to counteract the poison of self-love. The incessant thought of the holy souls keeps before us a continual image of suffering, and not of merely passive suffering, but of a joyful conformity to the will of God under it. Yet this is the very genius of the gospel, the very atmosphere of holiness. Furthermore, it communicates to us, as it were by sympathy, the feelings of those holy souls, and so increases our trembling yet trustful devotion to the adorable purity of God, and as, except in the case of indulgences applied to the dead, it requires a state of grace to make satisfaction for the sins of others. It is a special act of the lay priesthood of the members of Christ. The spirit of the devotion is one of pensiveness, and this is an antidote to frivolity and hardness, and tells wonderfully upon the affectionate character which belongs to high sanctity. Who can tell what will come after patient years of thus keeping constantly before our eyes a model of eagerness, unspeakable, patient eagerness to be with our dearest Lord? What a wonderful thing is the life of a fervent Catholic. It is almost omnipotent, almost omnipresent, because it is not so much he who lives as Christ who liveth in him. What is it we are touching and handling every day of our lives, also full of supernatural vigor, of secret unction, of divine force? And yet we consider not, but waste intentions and trifle time away in the midst of this stupendous supernatural system of grace, as unreflecting almost as a stone embedded in the earth, and borne around unconsciously in its impetuous revolutions day by day. Mother Gabriel de Colombier of the Incarnation was one of the Ursulines of Poitiers who went to found the monastery of Loudun. She passed the remainder of her life there in the practice of solid virtue to the great edification of all with whom she lived. Her superiors testified that her obedience was perfect and that she was most faithful in following the movements of divine grace. For three years before her death, she suffered much from asthma and bore her sufferings with admirable patience. Without relaxing in any way her assiduity at the regular observances and particularly at the divine office and mental prayer, in which she found all her consolation. She died on the 1st of November, 1660, age 63, and in her 41st year of profession. She had often said during her life that if God showed her mercy and accepted her desires, she would return after her death to declare to Mother Mary of the Angels what she would have known in the light of eternity for the salvation and perfection of the community. The zeal and desires of this holy religious were agreeable to God, 
In the following words, Mother Mary relates to Father Surin, a Jesuit, the circumstances of the apparition. On November the 6th, 1660, she writes, I felt myself strongly urged to ask of God that it would please him to show mercy to good Mother Gabriel. And if she did not yet enjoy glory to give it to her through the merits of the precious blood of Jesus Christ, his son, and through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin, whose holy scapular she had worn. What obliged me to make this petition was that the whole night I had my imagination filled with the thought of this dear mother. And often since her death, and although I wished to persuade myself that she enjoyed the happiness of heaven, my heart was troubled when I thought of her. In fine, I felt myself pressed to ask our Lord that, if it were for his glory and the good of several others, he would make known to us her state. A short time after, she presented herself to me with a very small countenance, sorry, a very mild countenance, appearing more humiliated than suffering, although I saw well that she suffered much. At first, seeing her near me, I was very much frightened, but as there was nothing terrifying in her appearance, I, I, was, <coughs> I was soon reassured. I made the sign of the cross, asked our Lord not to permit me to be deceived on this occasion, and I recommended myself to my holy guardian angel. I asked her in what state she was, and if we could render her any service. She replied that she was satisfying the divine justice in purgatory. I begged her to tell me what detained her there, if God wished that she should tell it to me for our instruction. She heaved a sigh and said, It is on account of several acts of negligence in the common exercises of regularity, also for a facility in yielding to the bad and imperfect sentiments of others but still more for the habit of retaining little things and disposing of them according to my wants or according to my natural inclination. God sees things very differently from the way in which we look at them. And if during life souls knew the injury they do to God and to themselves by not applying seriously to their perfection and how much they will have to suffer to expiate their weaknesses, their human respect and self-indulgence, they would have more facility in overcoming themselves and more firmness in following the lights of grace. I begged her to tell me how our community and I could remedy this evil. She replied, in general, they fail much in submission of judgment, interior recollection, charity and bearing with their neighbor and subjection to obedience. I have failed much in these things during my life. I asked if we could render her any service. She replied, I desire ardently to see and possess God, but I am content to satisfy his justice as long as it shall please him. I inquired if her suffering was great. It is, she said, incomprehensible to those who do not feel it. She then begged me to pray for her and disappeared. On the night of the 30th of the same month, Mother Gabriel again appeared to me and gave me to understand that she was undergoing a part of her purgatory among us, that she hoped to go to enjoy God on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin, and that this amiable mother in St. Joseph, to whom she had been greatly devoted, had obtained mercy for her, that her purgatory would have been long but for their aid. She told me that the greater number of religious had much to satisfy the divine justice for in the other life, must, must to satisfy the giant divine justice for in the other life, because they had not a proper application to the ordinary actions of religion, which they perform through routine, through routine, and that this has no excuse before God. I asked her what the soul suffers. She answered, the soul feels within herself an ardent desire, which like a devouring fire, urges her to go to unite herself with her God and she sees herself bound and kept back by a thousand little nets and cords which are consumed only very slowly by the activity of the fire. Her understanding is enlightened by a light which shows her the means that she had to break these bonds during her life, and she reproaches of her conscience, and the reproaches of her conscience make known 
to her that she has, through self-love, turned aside from the way of grace to follow that of nature and the senses, for which she condemns herself. She sees the designs that God had formed regarding her, with the want of correspondence on her part, and this sight is to her a great torment on account of the exceeding goodness that she sees in God and her own ingratitude. On the 8th of December, 1660, between 5 and 6 in the evening, Mother Gabriel appeared to me surrounded by a brilliant light and said, The goodness of God permits me to tell you that I go to enjoy him. Adieu, my dear mother. Labor for eternity to which you aspire. And assure mortals that whatever is not done, said or suffered for God, serves only for pain and torment. There are many souls deceived in their practices. I begged her to be our advocate with God. She assured me that she would and that she would pray for us. I recommended to her certain persons who had begged me to do so. She received my request with much goodness and kindness without saying anything distinctly. And approaching the window, which looks on the altar where the Blessed Sacrament reposes, made a profound genuflection. After that, an angel who was with her took her as if by the hand. Both were raised on high and disappeared from my eyes, leaving my heart full of joy for the glorious state of this happy soul. <laughs>